All right, everyone, I figured it was time to make a predictions for the 2020s, uh, the new 20s. Unfortunately, probably not retro art deco and flappers, although that'd be nice and it could happen. <laughs> there are certain things that are less likely. I figured I'd make this video because, I mean, a lot of people join the content specifically for predictions, especially of a political nature. And I'll start off actually with that, which is U.S. politics. I think that the 2020s will likely start off with Trump being reelected. Um, this will keep the commercial general state of growth going. And I think that that will contribute to a deflation of cultural tension, uh, at least, you know, in, in that particular political sense. The cultural tension will still be there and, and actually probably get larger, because what I think you're likely to see if Trump wins, especially by a large margin, is the collapse of the old leftist sort of uh, groups that have comprised the Democrats in the U.S., You'll see tension in British leftist groups, and you already do, between people who wanted more sovereignty and people who don't, people that wanted to be more pragmatic and win but abandon principle, and those that wanted to stick to principle and lose, uh, and we've seen this in the U.S. as well. You'll see this replicated, I think, all over Europe, and that'll be part of another prediction as re with regards really to the form and function of the EU coming up in the next decade. In the U.S., I think Trump wins, probably. It's not certain. We'd still have to get who's the nominee and so forth. Presuming, though, that the larger likelihood that he wins does happen. The old left collapses, their, their particular coalition in the Democratic Party falls apart. You then see, I think, the rise of a separate poll of further left individuals. Younger individuals, more idealistic, they'll be more socially alienated, more disenfranchised, under banners like AOC, Bernie Sanders, the actual left. Then you'll see the what used to be the leftist core with the business Democrats probably attempt to reform things and scrape them together. And you'll see a counter movement based on the far left that'll say, that's why we're losing. This is the problem. You're proposing all these solutions that can't work. You're proposing all these reforms that aren't palatable. They'll water it down and adopt a new sort of fusion platform and try to heal those schisms. What this means is that you won't see much, the far left will be marginalized along with maybe some of the old corporatists. If I had to look historically at what happens, I, I would say this will be sort of like a, a point and counterpoint situation where people try to meet in the middle, probably closer to neoliberalism than, than far leftism. But that could also be false. What could happen is that the far left just leaves entirely cracking the party apart for a generation, um, in which case the 20s will be a tale of the populist centrist core slowly waning, uh, the, the Trumpite core will slowly wane as it gets older. What will happen is it's less novel. Once it's less novel, it's less exciting, even if it is still pragmatic. Uh, that ideology over time as well economically, you got to understand, populism, lowering taxes, uh, ripping apart some of the bureaucracy, being, being mean to people on Twitter, that's what politically works right now. That's not to say it'll work in 2020. The paradigm socially could have shifted far, far away from that. We have to wait and see. That can't really be predicted because it's so unpredictable. Uh, it, would be, it would be me taking a flying fuck at a rolling donut trying to figure out that direction. Uh, politically, it's a little bit easier. In the U.S., you've got the Democrats and the Republicans. That's what you've got politically. You'll probably have a fairly solidified libertarian third party sort of thing going on. That could change, though. Uh, that could recede, and you could see like Jill Stein's people rise up. I think that's actually more likely. They'll absorb the leftists that leave the Democrats in the wake of their loss in 2020. Now, if Trump manages to lose, that'll socially alienate all the populists. They'll, I think, resurge in 2024 with a vengeance. Uh, and even before that, I think you'll see a second Tea Party sort of uprising, which will lock the leftists completely out of their own government, causing more social alienation. That would keep the current alienation paradigm going for almost the entire rest of another decade. I just don't think that's as likely. Onward to Brexit, um, European Union, European politics. I think it's fairly clear that the amount of animosity against the EU is growing in most parts of Europe. Um, it's, it's most pronounced in certain parts of, of Eastern, like Poland and the Czech Republic based on immigration, and in Western European countries on the basis of economics, where they say, well, we're paying all these taxes, we're shelling out to people that are coming and taking jobs anyway. This doesn't work for us. I think what's likely is more separatism, and it'll probably take a few years for those movements to, to truly 
gain more force. They've been growing anyway, especially in Germany, the Netherlands, and Poland, uh, and Hungary, of course, but they're still not quite there. Once, though, they hit critical mass, what will happen is the EU will feel pressured to implement reforms in order to keep those groups happy. But you can't implement the reforms being asked for by the lesser economies and the, and the greater, more conscious social powers in Eastern Europe and the decadent cultures of Western Europe that are mainly concerned about EU's economic principles. The two are irreconcilable. There's no, there's no middle ground because they're at opposite ends on two totally different topics. You will alienate one or the other. Germany will be pushing to alienate the rest of the Western Europeans more. It'll want to block with Eastern Europe to feed its manufacturing. France will probably want that too. Some of these other countries, uh, where there's maybe more economic xenophobia, you could say, will definitely want it to be more of a Western sphere. Well, you know, it doesn't make sense. We're devaluing things. We've got, you know, Italy and Poland on board. It makes no sense economically. You're asking us to prop them up. Why don't we just be a party in, in Western Europe and have their own bloc and maybe the Northern European countries become schismatic and want to join the UK? That's another thing to watch. If you have a hard Brexit and the UK's economy does reasonably well, it'll be held up as a standard for leaving the EU and it'll embolden these other groups. Which is exactly what the EU authorities are terrified by, which is why they're heaping abuse on the UK right now. Doesn't seem to be working at the moment. We'll see exactly how that plays out. If I had to guess, I'd say there will be a Brexit. Unfortunately, it's likely to include a deal. Uh, but there's a better chance now, certainly, than only a few months ago that it doesn't, which would be a true hard break. Is it a true clean break from the EU? We'll see. On to Asia. Uh, I think the Chinese economy is going to continue spiraling downwards. Um, they're pumping their economy as much as we are. Right now, basically, global economic catastrophe is being avoided by the U.S. and China being uh, separately willing to work together. Well, we're shaking hands in the back room and ignoring the fact that our economies are running on fumes continuously refed into them uh, by central banks. Uh, the U.S. has actually managed to claw its way forward a bit and create some real growth by this process. It's helping us. If we keep it up, at some point, real growth will begin to keep more pace with the funny money that we're printing, with the fumes we're feeding the economy on paper, and it will stabilize. Things will get a bit better and a bit more stable and less likely to collapse. With China, because of their economic model, it's not working. They're simply trying to maintain growth that's not actually going anywhere. You, building a, a rail that becomes used and becomes profitable is a lot better than building one off into the hinterlands that nobody rides. The problem with China is that for a long time, they created a lot of infrastructure expecting 8 or 9% growth. Now they're, what, down, down around 5 or something. They've got a lot of empty infrastructure that will never be filled and is currently degraded. They can't even maintain it. It's subpar. Um, the, the military apparatus that they've tried to build up largely has been defensive. Like the Spratly Island fortifications and now every other country in the region wants to get in on, um, that appears to have backfired diplomatically. China has made a series of calculated errors. The problem is they can't privatize further. They'd be essentially abandoning ideologically communism altogether at that point. They'd weaken the central state and end up with a liberal revolution. They can't crack down more because then the investors will flee. That's really the, cru the crux of China's problem is that their economy is propped up by foreign investment into the creation of goods and services that could easily be supplied by other nations anyway. That's why they're anxious to grab this trade deal up to ease tensions with the U.S. The U.S. needs China or it'll go into a recession. China needs the U.S. or it'll go into a deep depression. China definitely loses such an engagement. It hurts the West. When the U.S. goes into recession, it tends to drag everyone in Europe along with it. It wouldn't be fun. It'd be like 2008, but we'd survive. China, meanwhile, would become decrepit. It could undergo a revolution. Don't think that it's impossible. If the will of the population to enforce the draconian totalitarian moralism of the Chinese communist authorities wanes, what ends up happening is they end up with revolutionary fervor anyway. It's already there. The seed's been sown since the 1990s anyway. I believe that China is not long for this world unless it undergoes reform, and they have to do it very carefully. Also, propping up North Korea is unhelpful diplomatically. Uh, that's another thing. You could easily see North Korea and South Korea formally end hostilities. Uh, in the 2020s. Denuclearization is a different story. And we've already signaled, Trump at least, not, not the Pentagon of course, but Trump has signaled 
that that was a back burner question and that really what mattered was that there was peace on the peninsula, a scaling down of any tension there. Once that happens, everything else can be a lot easier because there's no war footing involved. Well, you don't, you don't worry so much about a nation having several dozen atomic weapons if they're not your enemy, if they're a stable country, if they're sort of diplomatically with it, culturally speaking. And we can already see this. This isn't even so much a prediction. This is just saying that it'll continue. What I've seen, especially fed by the Internet, is, is nostalgia for the past. That is that people are running out of new things, like, like new clothing styles. Everything's been experimented so much with, it's just a matter of inventing some new material and then repackaging the styles of the 60s or the 70s at this point. I, I go throughout Amsterdam, sort of a hipster city, you know, sort of with it with clothes, and the things that I see on display look like they were designed in the 70s and the 80s. They really do. And this is like, oh, Euro fashion, we're on top of the world. There's a lot of 90s nostalgia I've noticed in Europe, certainly in the United States. Uh, the music is kind of nostalgic as well. A lot of things are simply being repackaged. You could say that some of the new pop music sounds like, a, it sounds like techno and the 1920s had a child. There is some 20s influence, by the way, stylistically. I find that good. I think that's a wonderful thing. It's fitting since we're back in the 20s and another, well, less than a week now, like five days. Um, I think cultural nostalgia will kick in and it'll get bigger, a lot bigger, especially the fact that we're, no, nobody says, uh, like, like ask people, like, if you could be in a past decade, which one would you want to be in? Who answers the 1910s, like a century ago? Uh, almost nobody. A lot of them will answer the 20s. The fact that we're going to be in the 20s, our president is basically like, you know, silent cow sort of knockoff anyway in some ways, uh, only obviously not silent, I think will be helpful for the Western world. There will be a nostalgia for the days of great powers vying, some of the styles probably, and it would be nice if flapper style would come back, you know, just, just saying, uh, I think it'd be perfect. The only thing better would be the 80s, but I'm in a minority on that view because a lot of people don't like neon lights and bungees and stuff like that. I do. I think they're great. You know, swimsuit girl aerobics, uh, volume 15, sweating to the oldies. Uh, you know, everything all colorful and weird. The 80s were an odd time. There was a lot in the 80s that was really shitty. Looking back at it, like, musically, too, uh, there's a lot of really sappy ballad sort of love songs of the 80s I can't fucking stand. But then you've got some really great uh, sort of rock anthems, and you've definitely got some excellent, uh, extremely energetic pop. The high-energy sort of Italo disco thing really works. I would say you'll increase nostalgia, because what's happening is the Internet's becoming more and more intrinsic. And more and more older things are being dug up out of attics and basements and put on the Internet. It's like, it's like, you know, viral sensation, like Steve MRE eating Civil War hardtack and something like that. You go to that, and then you see in the recommended videos Civil War reenactments. Oh, here's how they cooked. Here's how they, how they dressed and stuff. There are people that will take that sort of uh, nostalgia for an era they've never even been part of, and they'll impart that. They'll imprint that upon modern culture. It's so like not that long ago, like at the end of the 2000s, I noticed that a lot of the styles in stores for female clothing looked like Little House on the Prairie. It looked like we had stepped back into like the fuck the fucking the 1880s or some crap. And I hated it. And the new ones look better. So it's a little Clinton-esque. It's like, you know, here's the women's leisure suits with uh, big shoulder pads. And I guess leather jackets like this, uh, up and coming fashion as well, which is hysterical. No, I'm not going to change it just because it'll make me look like a hipster, I guess. Although that's extremely regrettable. Maybe I'll cut nipple holes in it, just so that I'll look less normal. I'll, I'll be Martin Gore instead. Uh, <laughs> so, so those are some predictions, I would say. Oh, and the internet matters. Censorship will get worse over the next few years. That's almost inarguable. It's going to keep getting worse. At some point, it's going to start biting into the bottom line of the big tech firms, and they either scale back or they kill themselves off. And it's, each individual firm will have this happen. All tech will continue to grow because every time something goes wrong on YouTube, library gets bigger, BitChute gets bigger, other sites get bigger. Every time that Facebook alienates somebody, they set up a Minds page. Every time that Twitter has a mass purge going on, Gab gets bigger, Parler gets bigger. Um, it's, I think that this is ultimately how the tech paradigm shifts over. It's almost inevitable. So censorship will definitely keep getting worse, at least, you know, in the meantime, in the early 20s on the mainline platforms. The thing is that it's not clear that that censorship will be able to be 
uh, tenable, maintained long term, because eventually they no longer have a monopoly. We've already seen multiple sites get around the payment processing, bank crackdown sort of side of censorship. What's happened is the big tech firms now try to go for the jugular. The second that a site arises that could compete with them, they try to get them fiscally deplatformed. Well, you're platforming hate, so Visa won't process for you. PayPal won't work with you. You're not allowed to use Patreon and stuff. They found ways around it. Subscribestar, one of the capstones at this point of the alt tech revolution. Uh, cryptocurrency exists. Blockchains exist. Decentralized information. You're going to see a lot more of that, a lot more. Th think about it this way. Think about how life was at the end of the 2000s with your, with your fucking your Windows Vista or something like that and how life is now. Huge change. Big change, especially, especially outside of urban areas. They were kind of with it on the internet anyway by the middle of the 2000s. Where I was, like small town America, it was still kind of an afterthought. Huge. The internet, smartphones, everything. Think about, therefore, the next 10 years and how things will have changed by the end of the 20s. That's what we can't quite predict. we got to go to the early 20s first. I will say this, though, and this is guaranteed. Whether there's progression or regression, you know, I mean, massive plague kills half of humanity. We hit another dark ages, obviously. Things might slide backwards a bit. Regardless, things will be drastically different. They will barely even recognize your day-to-day -day life of today. I don't think they'll be flying cars and, and personal helper robots. It'd be nice. But unfortunately, we don't end up in fallout, not for another hundred years or so, I think. Um, things aren't going to go quite that fast. But when you think about the way things were a hundred years ago in 1920, uh, there is a little bit of a similar feeling. Even the, even the lashing back against like science and modernity was a big thing in like the late 1910s, uh, early 1920s. This sort of the norm, the cultural hegemon at the time was pushing back, Volkish movements rising up, pushing back against modernity. I'm beginning to see a lot of that now and have for the last couple of years. People are getting fed up with modernity. This will probably cause massive political upheaval. I don't think it causes like World War III or anything, but, you know, wait and see. So there's some uh, predictions. China will have problems, might collapse. The EU may fracture. It's, it's not going to go away. It's just it'll either be Germany and France and their Eastern European buddies for farm labor, or it'll be a Western European uh, economic bloc. The U.S., uh, things will march along, but there's going to be schisms on the left, probably on the right as well. Things, I think, will improve generally, but right now they're dicey. Right now there's a lot of cultural alienation. It's been largely created by a bunch of mindless authoritarians that don't understand how to govern. Uh, the hope is that this is tempered, that this is taken care of. But again, we'll wait and see. We can predict many things, but we can't predict everything, sadly. That's about all. Peace out.